much, dear Heavenly Father, for answering our prayer as you always do. Always answer your promises. Thank you for this. Thank you and bless now we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. We want to be like the one leper that came back and thanked Jesus. Isn't that right? So now, take your Bible and turn to the book of Revelation. And we're going to look at some things. Um, also, the, for those of you watching on your TV that missed our morning service, uh, if you'd like to get my free monthly letter, you can call my office at 618. 618 is the area code, and then 627-2357. Um, uh, they videotaped this morning's message, and Brother Richard, is he here? Oh, um, are people able to get that if they want to? Yes, it won't be ready today, though. No, not today, but you can see Brother Richard. And uh, this presentation is being videotaped. You can see him also. I'll also be uploading it onto the Internet. On the Internet, okay. And uh, how will they see it on the Internet? What do they go to? They can go to Google, and I'm going to put your name on it. Because they can type in Jan Markinson, and it'll probably pop up. Okay, and you can tell any of your friends, and they can see what you're about to see on the Internet. Just go to Google, yes. Uh -huh. But I'm putting it on Google, and they have a wide open door right now, and I can put it in full quality, wonderful, full time, and so it'll be as good as DVD quality that you can download and make a DVD yourself out. So they can download it into their own computer and put it on a DVD, make copies of those for other people. Well, praise God. Now let's take our Bible and turn to Revelation 13, and uh, uh, the whole book of Revelation really the whole Bible is talking about how God is going to do something. When God created the whole universe, uh, He created all the planets. There's probably billions of them. Um, the, the God has a great large family. No telling how many billions of planets there are that we're going to be visiting and getting to know those people for a long time. Won't that be fun? And very enjoyable. And uh, he created all of that and all the billions and billions of angels. Uh, but there was just one thing missing that God did not yet have. And what was it? A wife. He didn't yet have a wife to sit next to him. And he still doesn't have one that is sitting next to him yet. But he's working on having a wife. Isn't that interesting? Yeah. And so, do you think God is ever going to have a wife to sit in his throne with him that will be so intimate that it's described in the book Song of Solomon, which is even too embarrassing almost to read in public? Do you think God is going to do that and have a wife to sit with him in his throne? Do you think God wants to do something like that? Uh, well, that's a good uh, thought, isn't it? Uh, or a good question. Well, uh, God has been working on that, on a bride, for a long time. Does the Bible call his people his bride? Yes. Sister White also does the same. It says God's people are his bride. Um, uh, he could not just make one being to be his bride. Because if God made a being that was the most powerful and the most beautiful that an infinite God could possibly make, what would be that being's name? Light bearer, Lucifer. Because the prophet said that Lucifer was the highest and the most powerful, the most beautiful that an infinite God could make in one being. That was who that was. And so that one most beautiful, most powerful, most lovely being did not turn out to be God's wife. It turned out to be God's enemy. And so that didn't work. So the one to sit in his throne with him to be his beloved wife, his bride, has to be somebody other than that. It has to be an entire what? 
planet. An entire planet is going to be his bride to sit with him. It says in his throne. And that bride is you and me. If And God's people around the world, if we're faithful, from the time of Adam and Eve until the last saint that will be born, all of God's people, are they going to sit with God in his throne? Does the Bible use that term, in his throne, in Revelation? Yes, it does. That will be, it says, God's bride, God's wife. And that's what he's been waiting for for a long, long time. He's very patient for a bride, isn't he? But he's going to have one, and he's going to get one. And when he has her, will she be absolutely spotless and uh, fit to sit with him in his throne? Yes. And so when trials and troubles come to you, just remember... God is doing this for you to prepare you for a very, very high honor to be part of God's wife, God's bride, sitting with him, the Bible says, in, the word in his throne, with him, Jesus said, as I am set down with my father in his throne. Isn't that wonderful? And so the devil doesn't like that idea very much. You can understand that. And the devil would like to thwart God's plan uh, to, have, to prepare his bride to sit with him. And so here in Revelation 13, it tells about some of the devil's plans and uh, workings to, to thwart it. Verse 1, And I stood upon the sand of the sea and saw a beast rise up out of the sea, having seven heads and ten horns, and upon his horns ten crowns, and upon his heads the name of blasphemy. And the beast which I saw was like unto a leopard, and you know the four different beasts that make up this one power. And uh, one of his heads, verse 3, wounded to death, but the deadly wound was healed. Verse 4, and they worshiped the dragon that gave power unto the beast, that's the devil, and they worshiped the beast, that's the Roman Catholic power, saying, who is like unto the beast? Who is able to make war with him? This Roman Catholic power is Satan's counterfeit of God's bride. Uh, and she's very uh, lovely and all that outwardly, but and she's got a cup in her hand, and she's decorated, ver chapter 17, with gold and pearls and scarlet and all kinds of things decked out, but she's a harlot, chapter 17 tells us. Uh, it's the counterfeit of the devil, but uh, God's still going to have his pure bride, and so in chapter 13, it tells how the devil's trying to destroy God's bride, uh, through this beast power, trying to destroy her. And uh, also, there's another beast that comes up in verse 11 of chapter, 30, uh, chapter 13, and that two-horned beast represents what power? The United States. And so, uh, as we know, God has greatly honored and blessed the United States because it's the center of God's work in the last days where the three angels' messages go out from to the whole world. So the devil, of course is using Rome to attack also the United States and to corrupt that. Nevertheless, uh, God is blessing it and will continue to do so until she uh, enforces the mark of the first beast, and you know what that mark is, at the National Sunday Law. Verse 15 finally tells that this two-horned beast has so much power, and God allows it. In verse 15, he has power to give life unto the image of the beast, that the image of the beast should both speak and cause, that as many as would not worship, the image of the beast should be what? Killed. And he causeth all, both small and great, rich and poor, free and bond, to receive a mark in their right hand or in their foreheads, that no man might buy or sell, save he that had the mark or the name of the beast or the number of his name. Here is wisdom. Let him that hath understanding count the number of the beast, for it is the number of a, does it say computer? No, it's the number of a man. Uh, and Rome's agents try to divert it away from that one man onto many other things. And you know who that man is, don't you? The leader of that Roman Catholic power, the Pope of Rome. Uh, it says, for his number of a man, and his number is 600, three score, and six. The next chapter starts describing God's bride. Uh, the 144,000. And uh, then verse 6 to 10 tell the very message that God's people, 144,000, will be giving to the world. It's the three angels' messages uh, right there uh, given by this group of people. Now, with this in mind, 
uh, God's purpose for this world, for his people, developing his wife, his bride, to come home and sit with him and uh, co-rule the universe with him and be intimate with him as he reveals in Song of Solomon in many places. And we've reviewed Satan's plan to thwart that. Yet we know that God's going to win. Do you believe it? God's going to win. And that is very encouraging. No matter what the devil does, God's still going to win. And no matter what the devil does, it only helps produce and uh, make ready his bride. The devil can't do a thing to stop the preparation of God's bride. Isn't that beautiful? Even the persecution only drives her closer to her lover. And uh, uh, in her helplessness to cling to the lovely Jesus. And so with this in mind, I want to introduce now what we're going to see on the screen. Uh, now, this is very unusual, <laughs> very unusual, what you're going to see there. Because, as I mentioned this morning, what you're about to see is going to give you a little taste or a hint, a taste of things that are going to be happening in the near future. From what we're about to see on the screen, you're going to get a taste of what it's going to be like in, in, in a certain degree, what it's going to be like when God's people are hunted after this law is passed. You're going to get a little taste of what it's like to see this group that is described in chapter 14 um, suffering privation and hardship and yet putting everything they can into getting the three angels' message to the world under tremendous hardship at the same time. But yet they're successful, they're doing it, even through the opposition that they're receiving. You're going to get a hint of also uh, what it'll be like when uh, this law is passed and you see churches maybe even having a thousand members uh, and you see how many of those members cave in and go along with the Sunday law and how many of them are faithful and stand faithful even in the face of not being able to buy or sell or death itself. We're going to get hints and glimpses of all of these things by what we're about to see on the screen. Now, I'll tell you something interesting about this. Um, um, this interview, I just edited it a few days ago. I took it from a super VHS master, and I ran it into the computer to edit it and I worked real hard on it for two whole days just the day before I came here I just finished it this master that I used to edit, edit from was lost for 14 years <laughs> it was lost for 14 years we looked for it and wanted it for 14 long years, and just the other day, we found it. But I know why God allowed it to be lost for 14 years. Because 14 years ago, God did not want me to show this. Because there's things on here that would not have been good to show 14 years ago. Because of certain names of certain people holding certain offices at that time. They're out of the picture now. Um, and so, you know, they might not even be alive now. So now is the time that the Lord allowed this to be found. Uh, you are the first group that's ever seen what you're about to see, except for Sweet Vanita and myself and the people at our own church, which I showed it to last Sabbath. Uh, but other than that, you're the first group that has seen this. Um, I took this interview 14 years ago 1995. This is in our church. It's in the production room in our church in Benton, Illinois. In our church, we have 10 guest rooms that each room can hold two people. We can hold, house 20 people there. That's why in our medical missionary soul winning school, we can have 20 people come. And um, I mentioned earlier outside that um, if the Lord impresses you to come to the one May 17 for one week, you can call my office and you can tell them something that will shock my secretary. You can say, Pastor Jan said I could come free. Now, see, that's unusual, isn't it? 
but I do things like that once in a while. So, but if the Lord doesn't have you come this May 17 for a week, then don't come. But if he impressed you to come, you can come free. Uh, of course, you'll play, pay for your plane ticket or however you get there, but the food will be free for a whole week. The room will be free for a whole week. All the materials free for a whole week. And you can come, and, uh, but call soon so that, because we only have about 12 places left uh, before it's filled up, and then we have to put them on the next one, September 20. Um, but anyway, I interviewed this man in the production room, and you'll see that room if you come to our church. We have one of our classes in there. That was 1995, March of 1995, exactly 14 years ago. And um, he is going to tell us some things that uh, is going to give us glimpses of all these things I've just mentioned, things that are going to be happening in the future. Your eyes are going to be open to some of the things. Uh, you might be shocked at some of these things, but uh, uh, I believe holds God's Seventh-day Adventist Church because I'm upholding God's Seventh-day Adventist Church around the world against the Roman Catholic attack going on against it. And you knew, but there probably, you probably knew there was such a thing, didn't you? I put this on my 16-part CCA video series. There's 16 of them now. And um, so uh, this uh, will give you glimpses of amazing things. And so I'm about ready to start. If everyone's ready, you can turn the lights out. This, uh, the original interview lasted about an hour and 45 minutes. I edited this down to only 37 minutes. I cut most of it out, but I put in just the most important things. And I have the DVD here that I'm going to give to Brother Richard. And uh, he'll have the, this whole thing on DVD that you can get. So we're ready to start. Are you ready, Brother Richard? Yes. Okay. So you can turn all the lights off and we'll begin. Brother Bob Von Cannon, and he's got some tremendous and wonderful things to share with us and uh, what he's going to be sharing with us might seem indirect but uh, I think you'll see that it has a great bearing on this whole program of the great controversy between Christ and Satan isn't that right Amen. so um, where do we start well Jan I would say we probably need to start with the fact that my area uh, that I work in is primarily uh, the area of Soviet Adventism. Mm -hmm. And we should mention that uh, I learned to speak Russian quite a long time ago. Uh, the reason that I can talk about uh, the Adventist situation in the Soviet Union is because that I have been there, and there's been a fair number of Adventists that have gone to the Soviet Union, mm -hmm. but uh, unlike most Adventists who go over there, I can go over and talk to the people directly story that uh, has unfolded before my eyes in terms of the history of what's happened in Adventism in the Soviet Union mm -hmm. is one that is of very serious importance to Adventists that, because it involves decisions that were made directly by the General Conference. Mm -hmm. And that's probably what we should talk about today. Okay. Keep in mind, uh, you're t telling us these things, and the uh, bottom line, uh, really the title of this uh, pro program is called The Roman Catholic Attack on God's Seventh-day Adventist Church. Do you think there is such a thing? Oh, yes. And if I didn't think there was, was such a thing, I wouldn't have consented to be interviewed by you. Yes, I believe it. So uh, you're not just talking about some abstruse things here. No. Uh, you're talking, keep in mind as he talks, he's talking about a reality of a Roman Catholic attack on God's SDA church. Keep also in mind that it's very indirect. Rome all, always works. Of course, God's prophet Ellen White tells us that uh, Rome is the right arm of the devil's strength, and I call Rome the devil's girlfriend. Uh, she is the devil's girlfriend, and uh, he uh, works always in an indirect way because he tries to always look like the good guy, isn't that right? Yes. And he tries to make God's people, and even God himself, look like the bad guy. Uh, over a year ago, I uh, had an interview with a young man and uh, I videotaped him and I have the videotape of my interview with him sitting on my desk that videotape I've been looking at that videotape for over a year 
That videotape has been sitting on my desk for over a year, and it's still sitting there. Uh, this young man was part of the brains of uh, programming a number of computers to be sent to Russia. Now, see, his mouth just fell open. Did you I notice know that? Who the young man is. Yes, we won't give any names, but you saw his mouth fall open. Anyway, and uh, him and I have not talked about this. No. I didn't even mention this to you. you didn't, he didn't know this even existed. And uh, I never knew all that God was going to put all this together. And you didn't know, know it either until this moment. <laughs> no. And he got these computers all ready, and he helped them get sent to Russia. And I remember that much, but you know the rest of the story, don't you? Oh my. Well, okay, you want to know that story. <clears throat> yes, Dan, I'll tell it. In the course of meeting with him, he was he told me the story of these 300 odd computers that were sent to the Soviet Union. This is the first time I heard about it. Hmm. And he was in his own terms, he was an unhappy camper. Who was unhappy? This wealthy man whom I'm not naming. Oh, I see. Okay. You see because what had happened is he'd been asked by the General Conference to help finance the building of and, and putting in place a complete printing facility in the Soviet Union uh, in the mid-1980s for Adventism. Mm -hmm. And they wanted to do this outside of Moscow. Well, here's what happened. This man, uh, I'll call him Mr. G, if I can, just sure. for a label. Okay. Mr. G uh, came up with a great idea. He said, I'm not going to send a whole bundle of money over there. Uh, I don't know these people. They're still under communism. There could be some real problems. Mm -hmm. He said, what I'll do is this. He said, one of the things that they need over there is they need computers. Mm -hmm. What I'll do is I can buy computers here very inexpensively. I'll have a man put the computers together. These were XT-class computers in the mm -hmm. mid-'80s. Uh, put the computers together, 320... Forgive me, I think it was 324, but it doesn't matter. Mm -hmm. uh, these com I'll put the computers together. We'll put uh, the Russian alphabet on the keyboard, mm -hmm. and we'll have a, 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 uh, a word processor. So he uh, had his man in California do the job, and uh, the, this is the one you interviewed. Mm -hmm. And as you well know, those 300 computers uh, were all bundled up and sent to the General Conference Transportation Department, who then uh, did, I think, a container load to go to the Soviet Union, mm -hmm. and they dropped it right in the hands of Michael Kulikov. Mm -hmm. and, and who I, is he? Michael Kulikov, uh, at that time, was the president of the Euro-Asian Division. This is Neil Wilson, and on the viewer's right, this is Michael Kulikov. And he was the president of the Euro-Asian Division at that time. Uh, <clears throat> the 300 computers, were to be resold. Actually, a dozen of them were going to be kept by the conferences, and the 300 odd were going to be resold. So, if you take 300 computers and sell them for seven thousand dollars a piece, you've got over two million dollars. Yes. Okay, that's real fast math. Mm -hmm. This two million dollars was to build uh, several buildings in Zaoksky to house the printing press that Mr. G also bought. Now, with $2 million U.S., you could build a whole lot of things over there, couldn't you? You certainly could. Do you know what it actually built? What? It dug the foundation for five buildings, and they ran out of money. Hmm. Now, that's very unusual. It doesn't take $2 million to dig holes for five buildings, does it? No. No, you could have done that with probably a few hundred American dollars. Hmm. But the, you know who the computers went to? No, I don't know. Well, I know who was responsible for them, who received them, was Michael Kulikov. Okay, and he was the president. He was the president of the Euro-Asian Division. Do you know the genesis of this book? It's called The Kulikov File. Hmm. It is a, it's published by the Biblical Studies Institute in South Dakota. Mm -hmm. And uh, what happened was some faithful Adventist in the General Conference came across a file, a hidden file apparently, in the General Conference, and uh, it was a file of correspondence that had gone on between uh, people in the Soviet sector, the Euro-Asian division, mm -hmm. uh, and the General Conference. And I'd like to put this on camera if we could. Sure. Because this is a letter. It'll be on your left-hand page. It is a letter uh, by uh, Vice President Jan Paulson or excuse me, to, to Jan Paulson from Alf Loney. 
and it is a letter on general conference uh, stationery. Mm -hmm. And the answering letter, by the way, that answers it is over on the right-hand page. It's from Jan Paulson back to Alf Loney. Mm -hmm. And uh, this is dated 1982. Mm -hmm. And I would, with your permission, I'd like to read something because it's a letter about Michael Kulikoff. Sure. Uh, this is uh, December of 82, and the other one's January of 83. Okay, so you can see that one is an answer to the other. Yes. Okay. Dear Jan, I know that you are aware that the question of children attending school on Sabbath is the problem in the USSR, mm -hmm. and that it is this matter which more than anything else causes separation among the brethren. All registered pastors must send their children to school on Sabbath. Uh, wait a minute now. That's too powerful. We've got to comprehend that a minute here. There's no way in the world that a Seventh-day Adventist is going to send his child to school on Sabbath, so he must be talking about non-Adventist pastors doing that. Well, Brother Jan, you said that uh, no Seventh-day Adventist was going to send their child to school on Sabbath, and I agree with you. Mm -hmm. uh, now, did the uh, registered pastors agree to send children to school on Sabbath? That's what it says. Hmm. Well... Uh, I'll, yeah. I'll answer that even further after I read this letter. Yes. Okay. Uh, this is also the point which the government emphasizes in their dealings with us. So we're talking about Sabbath keeping here. This is the subject of the letter. Because this kind of thing is going to come, uh, that's a, a similar thing to the National Sunday Law. You know, uh, violating God's Sabbath to honor Sunday. And so here we have, well, go ahead. You just don't know how many of my buttons you just pushed. <laughs> <laughs> Bear with me, brother. In a group that met in Manila, which included N.C. Wilson, V.N. Olson, W.R. Lesher, and me, we discussed a paper written by M. Kulikoff on this question. Hmm. I'm going to insert an aside and point out the question, the subject of the matter is Sabbath keeping, whether you can break Sabbath under state pressure or not. Hmm. And these, this is the top of the general conference. We've got Neil Wilson, who's general conference president here, mm -hmm. Olson, Lesher, and Loney mm -hmm. meeting in Manila. And they're reading a paper that is written by Michael Kulikoff, who's president of the Euro-Asian division. Mm -hmm. Well, this is what they said. No one in the group saw any light in the paper, just the opposite. Dr. Lesher called it situational ethics. Of course, the paper will please the authorities, but I'm afraid it will split the churches even more. Fortunately, Kulikov has shown it to only a few people and has not had it printed. Hmm. It is obvious that a paper which indicates that Sabbath keepers are legalists hmm. is dynamite, especially in the USSR. Hmm. Amazing. Now, so that you, paper was upholding sending children to school on Sabbath? Absolutely, and that was Michael Kulikov's official position, and he has never changed it. Hmm. And who wrote the paper? Michael Kulikov. Hmm. It, this letter goes on to say that they're going to have the biblical research group work on this problem. Hmm. I don't know why you'd need a biblical research committee to work on a problem of whether or not to keep the Sabbath. That's right. But apparently the biblical research committee must have issued a formal statement saying, no, we can't go along with this. They have to keep the Sabbath. Mm -hmm. Because two pages later, and it's addressed to Elder George Reed of the Biblical Research Institute, and mm -hmm. it is signed by Michael P. Kulikov, uh, who was president of the Russian Federation of Soviet Republics at that time. Mm -hmm. And um, he goes through this letter. I'm not going to read it. It's far too lengthy. Yeah. But if you go through the letter here and read it, you will find that what Michael Kulikov is doing is he is trying to get the uh, committee from the Biblical Research Institute to reverse their stand on Sabbath keeping. Wait a minute, wait a minute. Oh, oh, I see. Uh, Kulikov is trying to get the general conference, uh, that committee, to say you can break the Sabbath. That is exactly what he is attempting to do. Hmm. You ask about Michael Kulikov, I'm going to ask for the camera to zoom in, zoom in on a photocopy of a page of a newspaper. Hmm. Is that a Russian newspaper? Yes, this is a Russian newspaper. Oh, there's the camera we've got. This is a Russian newspaper. It's from the newspaper Izvestia. And it's an article entitled Vyechny Rab Cheka, mm. um, which translated into current modern English means an eternal slave of the KGB. Hmm. Uh, now, who is an eternal slave? The, uh, that newspaper? Uh, no. 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 This is an article written by a writer um, for, the, for his vestia. I heard on an airplane, there was someone, I was on the airplane, someone behind me was talking, and they said, don't be fooled. 
They said the KGB is still there. Yes, he is documenting how the KGB penetrated and controlled every church in the Soviet Union throughout the entire reign of communism there. Hmm. Every church. But I don't want to give the impression that he's picking on the Seventh-day Adventist church. Uh, actually, all the churches, he's including that. All. Including that. Including that. And in, as a matter of fact, I'd like to read one here just to show how wide-ranging the activities were. Because the thrust of his article is that, is that the KGB operated illegally, autonomously, mm. and controlled all religion. Because, see, the Jesuits, they don't just infiltrate one church. They infiltrate them all. Amen. Here it is. Uh, this says, uh, Vancouver, Canada, uh, in Vancouver, Canada, at the 6th General Assembly of the Worldwide Council of Churches, the religious delegation of the USSR was composed of or included 47 agents of the KGB among a number of other religious authors, etc. Hmm. So, Worldwide Council of Churches in Vancouver, uh, 47 KGB agents went there from the Soviet Union. Amazing. Now, I wonder if the uh, World Council of Churches knew that there were 47 KGB agents there. Well, I doubt that they were told that. Yes. My interest is in Adventism. Yes. Because I have a very tunnel vision. I'm an Adventist. Yes. And... I'm, I brought this out just simply to show that he's not picking on a given religion. There's several other religions here. Sure. But this one is the one that got my attention. Hmm. It says, and I'm translating now, November 1986, please note that date, through the leading agency or through the leading activities of a number of preachers of the SDA, and in parentheses they spell it out, Adventists of the Seventh Day, in the city of Tula, the re-election of the senior church official for the central region was carried out. Hmm. As a result, uh, our agent, codename Svetlov, was again placed in this job. And it's saying that their KGB agent got elected to be the Seventh-day Adventist leader. Re-elected. Re it says he was placed in it again. Oh, re-elected. Re-elected. Mm -hmm. This is a November report now. This is internal KGB correspondence. Yes. So this is the November report, reporting on what happened in October. Mm -hmm. And uh, at that election, Michael Kulikov was re-elected as the president of the Central uh, Region of the mm. Seventh-day Adventists. Amazing. Does that explain why he wrote the letter saying that the General Conference ought to make get people to forget the Sabbath and send their children to church to, to school on, on Saturday? Is that why? Would a KGB agent do that? Well, absolutely. The KGB's method of operation is to put a person in place and to have him bend the rules and change the di direction of an organization gradually but firmly hmm. to the direction they want them to go. And yes. they don't ever want them to go toward Jesus, no. which is where we want everyone to go, is Amen. toward Jesus. Yes. Instead, they want them to go toward total submission to the state authority, which is run by Satan. Hmm. Yes. Our mighty God is in control. You believe that, yeah. don't you? He's Amen. in control. And he allowed what happened. He allowed that man to not only get elected, but he allowed him to get reelected, just like he, well, didn't Caiaphas, wasn't Caiaphas there when Jesus was there? He was. God allowed, he allowed that. Um, uh, he allows everything for the good of his people. Now, is there, uh, when we take the story a little farther, what else should we look at? What I would like to do is I would like to turn our eyes, if I might, upon Jesus. Amen. This is perhaps a little bit different painting of Jesus than you've ever seen before, but it is a theme that we all recognize. And you don't have to be able to read the language that this book is written in. It's not Russian, by the way. This is Ukrainian. Mm -hmm. uh, and I think if you just simply look at the picture... And then we'll flip over to the next page, and you look at that picture, and I don't think you have to look at very many pictures before you know the subject matter that this book is dealing with. This is end time events, hmm. yes. okay, focusing on Jesus as our salvation, mm -hmm. okay? This is a book that is designed to bring people to Jesus hmm. and to bring them the Adventist message, Yes. okay? And it is done uh, by Adventists in the city of Lvov. It's right there on your map. Uh, he lived in a home that had no water of any kind, no mm. running water coming in, no running water going out. Mm. Uh, 
the facilities were in the backyard, and his wife would have to go down to the town pump and haul the water back for the day. Mm -hmm. Very, if you want to take a bath, go down two blocks and buy, purchase a bath at the local Russian bath. Mm -hmm. These are the facilities he lived in, and I, I looked at this and I asked him, I said, uh, does the conference pay so poorly? And he said, well, no. He says, but uh, I use my money to do this. And mm -hmm. there was a stack, Jan, of about 10,000 of these in his bedroom. This particular book is entitled Maya Nadia, My Hope. Mm -hmm. And it is published uh, independently by, let's call them independent Adventists. They're still members of the registered church there. Mm -hmm. And this man was a registered conference pastor. Mm -hmm. But he's publishing this independently. And I asked him, I said, uh, Brother Samalenko, I said, I noticed that you're, uh, that it doesn't say that this was published by the Seventh-day Adventist Church. Why not? And he said, well, uh, because it doesn't have uh, Zhukaluk's name in it. Mm. And I said, well, why doesn't it have Zhukaluk's name in it? He says, because if I put Zhukaluk's name in here, none of this material will ever be published. Mm. He's opposed to it. Mm. Even though this was a conference pastor? Yes. Mm. And I said, uh, I think I understand. I said, so you're not receiving any help from the conference to publish this? No, I'm doing this all on my own salary. Mm. Mm. And I said, well, that makes you an independent ministry, doesn't it? That's right. He was an independent conference minister. <laughs> Pastor Samalenko had been sick for the past four days with a stomach ailment, a pain right here. Mm-hmm. And that morning, uh, he brought us our tickets. We were to leave Kiev and travel uh, from Kiev all the way back out to the Hungarian border. Hmm. And he laid down on the couch in Sasha's house, in Sasha's apartment. He laid down on that couch. And I didn't think he looked very well. Hmm. This is a conference pastor. This is a conference pastor, hmm. Vasily Sakharovich Samalenko. He laid down long about 2 o'clock, in the afternoon, it was very right at two o'clock in the afternoon. Vasily Sakharovich doubled over in extreme agony, mm. uh, loud groans, and it was very obvious what would happen. What had happened within a matter of two or three minutes, uh, he'd gone cold and clammy, cold clammy sweat on his forehead, extreme pain in the abdomen, and I don't think it takes a first-year medical student to diagnose a ruptured appendix. Yes. Sasha got on the telephone and called for an ambulance, and for the next three hours we kept calling for an ambulance and waiting for an ambulance to show up, and it never arrived. They, apparently the ambulance drivers were out drunk somewhere. Mm. Vasily Sakharovich, at 5 o'clock, he was still there. This is... Do you remember Mrs. White talking about the great disappointment and how it was a blessing? Yes. This was a blessing. It's a hard one for me. I got to know the man, and I got to love the man. Yeah. Here's a man doing a work for the Lord under extreme difficulties. I, lay, I sat there in that room with Vasily Sakharovich, and I heard him for three hours. During those three hours, and by the way, he died a little after we left. Mm -hmm. Vasily Sakharovich was obviously on his deathbed, and he knew it. Yes. He prayed, and his prayer was continuously nothing but variations on one theme, and that was, Lord, it doesn't look like I'm going to leave here. Uh, it looks like I'm going to die. He says, Lord, I know that you can heal. If it's your wish, you can heal me, mm. but I submit to your will. Yes. Lord, I have done my work for you, and if it is your will that I should go on and serve you more here, I'm willing, heal me. If it is not your will, take me. Mm. This was his prayer for three hours. Praise the Lord. Somewhere shortly thereafter, after the time that we had to leave, his prayer stopped. Mm. I, there's no question about what that man was. Yes, he was a Christian. You don't die that way. No. no. Unless you're a Christian. Yeah. He had the hope. Amen. Praise God. I'm sorry. Praise God. That was hard for me. Amen. It was very hard. It was a blessing. Yes. So I, I have no doubt about who this man was. Yes. I know what these people are made of. I've seen it. Three conference pastors, one of them dead now, mm -hmm. all asked me to come to the West and tell people what the reality was. Yes. And they asked me to say something, and I'm going to say it. They asked me to say, don't send a nickel through the conference system because it never gets here. Mm. Remember those 300 computers? Yes. Where did the money go, Jan? We don't know. We don't know. All we know is that it disappeared. I'm just wondering, when you went over to the Soviet area, did any of these agents uh, know that you were in there? 
Uh, but go ahead and tell us whatever you want to okay. tell us. Well, I guess I'll, I'll answer that question right now, and provided that you'll keep the tape rolling long enough so that I can tell you some more good news. Okay. Okay. Uh, yes, the KGB knew we were there. When we went in, uh, <clears throat> we had to, I had to stop and purchase a visa at the border, which you could do at that time. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> and when you do that, you have to give them an itinerary of where you're going. So I gave them the first town that we were going to. Mm -hmm. From that point on, we traveled via underground techniques. This book that I'm holding in my hand um, probably weighs about a pound. Hmm. I value it uh, at about the same, same value as a pound of gold. Amen. This was brought out to me by courier. You can see it's in the Russian language, I believe. You can focus in on that one. And um, it looks like it's been typed with a typewriter. That's correct. Amazing. A book like that? It's, in fact, you, did, you missed out on something, Brother That's... Jan, if I may correct you here. This is typed with a typewriter. You'll notice the paper, you probably can't tell. It's very thin tissue. It's not typed on both sides of the sheet, is it? That's correct. Just it's on only one... on one side because the sheets are so thin. Thin, yes. And it is not an original. This is a carbon. So this is a carbon copy book, Amazing. hand typed, and it is also hand bound. Hmm. There's a man. Now they haven't done that since the Dark Ages, have they? Well, the Dark Ages just began to lift a little bit in the Soviet Union in 1992. Hmm. The man who typed this book. Okay, camera crew, here we go again to the map. Lives right here in Kiev. It says, "Proroki uh, Itzari." Prophets and Kings. Hmm. And up at the top it says E. White. Hmm. This man, along with all the real Adventists in the Soviet Union, hmm. really does believe that Mrs. White was inspired Amen. by God, that she is a prophet of God, Amen. and that these works are inspired, and so he is being painstaking, hmm. doing painstaking work to preserve yes. that spirit of prophecy in his language, Praise as close God. as he can get it to the yes. originals. This is Patriarchs and Prophets hmm. uh, by Mrs. White, and it is also another hand-typed, hand-bound volume. Hmm. When I saw these in Sasha's house, I said, Sasha, I saw approximately two dozen of these things, hmm. all different books. Yes. Because I'd had people telling me the spirit of prophecy doesn't exist in the Soviet Union. Yeah. That's wrong. It does exist. It has been protected by faithful Adventists. Amen. And Sasha's one of and those. by God. <laughs> by God. Amen. I was in a woman's home in Bogoslav, mm -hmm. where I was staying, being hosted there very nicely. And she walked into the room where I was making notes, and she said, Oh, uh, means, what book is that? Mm. I said, Oh, Eta Velika Barba, uh, Sister Vaita. Mm. I said, That's the great controversy of Sister White. Mm -hmm. And her answer, it got to me. She said, Oh, Yaslishala Bete Knigi. I've heard of that book. <laughs> She's a Seventh-day Adventist all her life, and she'd never seen a copy. Well, she heard of it. She'd heard of the book. I gave her my copy. Praise mm -hmm. God. They treasure them over there. Oh, yes. Oh, friend, may God help us treasure the truth of God here. May God help us fill our minds with the Word of God and with the spirit of prophecy. Isn't that right? May we appreciate it, and may we put it in our minds, and, and may we teach it to others uh, to help them before they're dead, before time runs out. Don't worry about who is what kind of agent. Don't worry about who is a Jesuit. Keep your eyes on the lovely Jesus. Don't condemn people if they're not in a conference church. Amen. Don't condemn people if they are in a conference church, like that faithful man uh, writing these books that died for Jesus, a martyr for Christ. Don't condemn that man because he's a conference pastor. Right. Uh, condemn your own self. I must condemn only my own self. Right. Jesus said, if you'll judge yourself, Don't you won't along. be judged. Now, I want to ask two things. I want you to tell me, number one, if this KGB agent masquerading as a Seventh Adventist leader knew you were in Russia and if he tried to get you. I want to mention the Pope's visit to the Philippines. The Pope's visit, visit to, to the, the Philippines, Philippines okay. which occurred in uh, about the third week, no, about the third week of January mm -hmm. of 1995. Mm -hmm. I showed up in the Philippines with Brother Ralph Larson, mm -hmm. and I wanted to mention the fact that while we were there, an announcement was made in the Philippines that a new law is going into the effect, mm -hmm. uh, wherein they're going over to a six-day work week, as I understand it, of mm -hmm. seven hours a day. Mm -hmm. And you can guess which six days they are. They are Monday through Saturday. 
Crazy. The Pope shows up in the Philippines, and the next week the government says we're going to a six-day work week and everybody's going to keep Sunday. What, the reason I bring up this whole incident is because they are also ordering that schools will be open six days a week mm. and will be attended by children. Amazing. Uh, there's a mainline Seventh-day Adventist church, mm -hmm. and that pastor stood up and told his congregation about the new law and informed them that the Seventh-day Adventist church school will be open on Sabbath and their children will be expected to attend. Mm. Now, that, Brother Bob, is telling us, it's telling you what is going to happen in this country soon when the National Sunday Law is passed. I just spoke to a man who is in this country right now. I, For security reasons, I'll leave him nameless. Okay. Um, and he came from there and he told me that out of that conference church of 1,000 people, only six people refused to send their children to school on Sabbath. Yeah. Why was this? This was because their pastor, their conference president, uh, and their, their uh, division president, Michael Kulikoff, hmm. Uh, and the president of the General Conference hmm. all told them to send their children to school on Sabbath. That president of the General Conference was, was Neil Wilson. Amazing. In this new catechism of the Roman Catholics, they go through and present all of their reasoning and point out that the Bible says to keep the seventh-day Sabbath, but they keep the eighth-day Sabbath, yes. which, of course, would be Sunday. Yes, I read and that. There were no eighth days. In, no. no. The thing that really amazed me was in one of the later sections of it, they go through how to prefer, preserve the good of society in the face of people who don't go along with the laws of society. Mm -hmm. And they're speaking specifically now about church laws. They call for Sunday to be enforced by civil law here. Mm. And they say that in, uh, let me quote it, uh, it is the right and duty of legitimate public authority to publish mail factors by means of penalties commensurate with the gravity of the crime, hmm. not excluding in cases of extreme gravity the death penalty. Amazing, yes. Here is the Roman Catholic Church. A new catechism. New catechism calling for the death penalty for Sabbath keepers. When you were in, in uh, that area, did that KGB agent by the name of Kulikov, do you think he knew that you were in the country? Well, I don't know about Kulikov, but I surely know about Zhukaluk. Okay. Zhukaluk, now, Kulikov was division president. Mm -hmm. Kulikov is up there in Moscow someplace. Okay. Down in the, the Ukraine where I was, uh, right here in Kiev, we mm -hmm. had Zhukaluk, who mm -hmm. was president of the Ukrainian Union. Okay. And uh, do you think Zhukaluk would like to uh, not send children to school on Sabbath? Oh, he's openly stated that. He was one of the major people in the Ukraine for preaching that uh, he sh that everyone should send their children to school on Sabbath. Hmm. That's exactly what he was preaching. Amazing. Uh, there was Zhukaluk was a union president down here preaching it, and there was another one whose name I've forgotten up north who was doing the same thing, both reporting to Kulikov. Yes. So there's no question about where they stand. Yes. I was a former... Professional, in, professional intelligence agents. So we say that for the uh, uh, Department of the uh, uh, U.S. government a okay. long time ago. I didn't know if you were going to bring that out or not. I wasn't going to tell him that you were a spy unless you... Unless I you just have to mention it because uh, you have to understand why I notice things like this. Yes. My antenna go up. Because you had been doing that yourself. That's right. And there was one occasion, for instance, over here in Berlin, Germany, that I'll never forget, where if... I hadn't been alert and noticed that somebody, two other people, did something that didn't make sense mm -hmm. uh, late at night. If I hadn't noticed that, I think I might be dead right now. Yes. Uh, so you noticed this man smoking a cigarette got on the bus? After we got on. He waited intentionally until we got mm -hmm. on, and there was nobody seeing him off. And that was in the uh, Soviet Union? Yes, this is right here in uh, Bogoslav. Okay. Right here. Because out on the street, three blocks from Sasha's house, there was a young man sitting on the corner of the sidewalk reading a newspaper hmm. on the main drag. Guess who he was? Could it have been the guy that was smoking the cigarette that got exactly on the bus? Exactly the same one. He was waiting for you. He was waiting for us. Hmm. And Someone uh, had spies on your track to catch you. Yes, KGB stooge. Hmm. Uh, so uh, I spotted him before he spotted me, mm -hmm. and that took care of that. And he did spot you? No, he didn't spot me oh, this time. I okay. saw him, and we I... detoured around him. Okay. But he obviously was tailing us, 
and he lost the tail when we took a taxi. Mm -hmm. So he turned in the taxi number to the KGB. The KGB pulled the taxi man in mm -hmm. and said, where did you take him? And he said, I took him to such and such a street. Mm -hmm. And they put him on the street right there to see, knowing we were in the area, to see if he could pick up our tail. Mm -hmm. Okay. So, yes, we have KGB interference here. Mm -hmm. There's no question about this. Yes. There wasn't any question in my mind that Zhukaluk knew we were in the area. He had reports from the conference church mm -hmm. in uh, uh, Bialyat Tserkov. Mm -hmm. And so then we... And they also had the KGB agents out looking for you. That's what came across when we went to cross the border into Budapest. Because mm -hmm. we managed to go through the train system again undetected and get uh, to the train station here uh, near Chop. Mm -hmm. And we went through this little unusual border crossing, uh, a uh, motor vehicle crossing, we went through that, and when we got to passport control, the young KGB agent there said, uh, where are your papers? And we were supposed to have checked in with the KGB everywhere we went reporting our own movements. We mm. never did that. We had no papers. Mm. So he didn't get any answer out of me. Uh, the next, he invited somebody else in there, and they had an argument in the, in the booth. Mm -hmm. And uh, then he turned around to me and he asked a question that sent sweat pouring down my back and mm -hmm. chills up and down my spine. He said, We believe Kiev, you evolve you. Were you in Kiev and Lvov? Mm -hmm. That's the only two he asked about. The KGB had an all points uh, lookout going for two Americans yes. who had been in Kiev and Lvov and uh, that they were to be picked up. Mm -hmm. Here we were trying to cross the border with no papers saying where we'd been. Now, wait, uh, here you are standing with sweat pouring down your back because if my mind is right, you knew that you'd been a former spy. You knew that these KGB agents had been reported and they, uh, Rome does not like true Seventh-day Adventists. And since you had been a former spy, if you'd have said, yes, I've been to those two places, uh, is there any possibility that you might be in Siberia right now? I don't think I would have survived it. I think I'd be dead. You think you'd be dead? But what happened? Well, I did, we didn't answer him. And then what, not answering. Then what happened? Well, they, then he called in a third KGB agent. Now, people can tell me, you know, they've told us before that there was no KGB, that it was all dissolved. Well, these guys are wearing green shoulder boards, mm. green pips in their uh, lapels, which mm. is the color of the KGB. Mm -hmm. And right on their shoulder boards, it says PV, which stands for Pagodinichne of Iska, the Border Patrol. Mm. These are the same guys whose business was shooting people to, uh, for trying to get out of the Soviet Union. Mm. This is the KGB. There was no mistake anywhere else that would have reported directly to the KGB that mm. we were in Kiev, except for Nikolai Zhukaluk. Right. So when we crossed the border and he said, were you in Kiev and Lvov, it was plain as day mm. what happened. And you didn't say a word? Couldn't. What can I say? And then what happened? If I said no, I'm lying. If I said yes, I'm dead. They turned to Ron. Ron, bless his heart. And so Ron held up this map that pointed to Ilnitsa, and he says, we went to Elnitsa. <laughs> and uh, they looked at that, and they weren't very impressed. And they had another conference back there with a lot of shouting and hand-waving. I bet you were praying, weren't you? This is life or death. <sighs> yeah, I, I'm sure I was praying. I'm also sure that uh, I was in violation of Jesus' command to fear not. I hope I learned from it, because I was terrified. Yes. Uh, the uh, truth of the matter is I was scared. And uh, I, I really hope I've learned from that because I'm sure that test will come around again to me. Yes, to all of us, really. Uh, yes. We need to know God, we believe me. We better stay in close connection yes. with Him. And at any rate, finally, this young, K, the young KGB agent, I don't know what was said back there, but you know, with a look of total disgust, he grabbed his stamp, stamped our two passports, and threw them back to us. Hmm. And... We picked up our passports and we calmly walked to the car. I was halfway expecting a bullet between the shoulder blades. Wow. And we got in the car and drove into Hungary. Did you know Hungary is a beautiful Oh, country? praise <laughs> the Lord. Yes. Oh, my. How wonderful God is, isn't that? Wow. Yeah. I mean, God is so good. I never saw anything so nice as that Hungarian railway train when I got on it. Amen. You can know that as long as God has a work for you to do for the lovely Jesus, he will keep you alive to do it. We also need to know that we're not in Disneyland here. Okay. Where it's not a Mickey Mouse game, even though we live over here in the United States, uh, there is a great controversy going on here now as well, and you're in it. May God help us to yeah. draw close to God, and then 
these people are ty- had been typewriting these books. It took them one year to do that, didn't it? For each book. May God help us get what we can out fast to the people because our day is coming very soon. Isn't that right? Amen. God is going to have men and women that are true Seventh-day Adventists, Amen. not what they profess, but what they are. Amen. I hope you got a blessing from that. Did you get a blessing from that? The tastes of the little glimpses of the things of the future is what we see and what is his experience. And uh, like I said, I pray that God will help us to be grateful. Is that dear pastor uh, spending every penny he could to get these books out before he died? And them doing in, under such unbelievable circumstances, their love for Jesus and their love for souls, I pray God will give us that love. Amen. We also got a glimpse of what it's going to be like when this law comes, because remember that church of a thousand people, only six people, these are Seventh-day Adventists, only six Adventists out of a thousand stood up to keep God's Sabbath. Will it be similar in the future? Yes, it'll be similar. In fact, last day events, page 180, says that the majority will forsake us. <clears throat> I have that quote here. Um, it's also in a Review and Herald article. Uh, Review and Herald, January 11, 1887. I'm going to read it to you. It says, Already the judgments of God are abroad in the land, as seen in storms and floods and tempests and earthquakes, in perils by land and sea. The great is speaking to those who make void his law. When God's wrath is poured out upon the earth, who will then be able to stand? Now is the time for God's people to show themselves true to principle. Now here's the sentence. When the religion of Christ is most held in contempt, when the law or his law is most despised, then should our zeal be the warmest and our courage be the most unflinching to stand in defense of truth and righteousness when the majority do what? Forsake us. us. Uh, To fight the battles of the Lord when champions are what? Are few. This will be our what? Our test. Uh, When the majority forsake us, that's the entire denomination, more than 50%, Uh, We don't know what percentage, but that little thing of a thousand with only six standing gives us a little bit of a hint how it's going to be. That's already happened Um, and uh, in many, many places. But it says champions are few. This will be our test. But don't be discouraged because God has his people all over this world and uh, God's people are always in the what? In the majority because most of God's uh, uh, church is, is uh, covering the whole universe. Isn't that right? Always in the majority with God. And so the article goes on. Um, uh, let's see here. It says that, now this article is so wonderful because not only does it say the majority will forsake us and this will be our test, but also it says we must gather warmth from the coldness of others, courage from their cowardice, loyalty from their treason. The na- this nation will be on the side of the great rebel leader. The days of purification of the church are hastening on apace. Notice she uses the word church. I use the word bride. You could use the word people, church. It's all interchangeable. It's just talking about God's people. We're being purified, and this is why God is allowing these things. And that is good for us to get ready for heaven. It, of course, hurts our heart to see so many getting ready for hell. That hurts us, doesn't it? But especially those that you love, that'll be the hardest part. But just pray, pray for them, our loved ones, and draw close to Jesus yourself. Be a lovable and loving Christian. And that love and that joy, it says the joy of the Lord is your strength. The joy of the Lord is the greatest thing, along with God's love, to draw people that's the best thing we can do for our loved ones who already know the truth um, is to see your sweetness and your love for them. It worked with my sister and with my dear brother whom I was with 
uh, just less than two weeks ago, just before my father died. And I'm going to go back to see them just after my, as soon as I can after the funeral. Uh, but but uh, I, I know just the, the sweetness of, of your kindness and love to your loved ones is the best thing you can do for them. Since the days are fast approaching, where there'll be great perplexity and confusion, Satan clothed in angel robes will deceive, if possible, the very elect. Every wind of doctrine will be blowing. It's, it's about that way now, isn't it? Um, so it says, the prophet looking down the ages saw all these things. Uh, also, he saw God's people getting ready for heaven. And I won't read this, but you can read it. Review and Herald, January 11, 1887. And that article is entitled, Our Present Duty and the Coming Crisis. Now, I'm going to say uh, that when the devil sees, or when he thinks, oh, by the way, I just saw this. I cut it out of the video, but on that video, Brother Bob Von Cannon and I discussed his work in Russia, and he said he wanted to help get the National Sunday Law book into Russia in the Russian language. Uh, at that time, the Sunday Law book was in 18 languages. Now it's in 62 languages. Do you know what I'm holding in my hand? A Russian National Sunday Law book. Isn't that wonderful? Yeah. Those dear, precious people over there, I don't even know who did it, made it into the Russian language. They worked day and night translating it, writing it down, typesetting it, and they got it printed, and here it is. Praise the Lord. And um, so that's a real blessing just to look at that, that they got that into Russia. Um, when the devil can see that he, or thinks that he can get away with it, he's holding this Sunday law issue undercover right now. He doesn't want anyone to think of it, especially Seventh-day Adventists, because if they know what's going on, we might wake up, and the devil doesn't want that. He wants us to just come and hear nice sermons and have nice spiritual entertainment and then go home and say, oh, wasn't that nice? Wasn't that wonderful? Wonderful sermon. And then go through our week and reach nobody with nothing. <laughs> nobody, especially with the three angels' messages. And then come back the next week and have another nice sermon and go home and do nothing except try to make some more money and so forth, watch a TV and then go to bed. Uh, but he doesn't want us to wake up and work for souls like these precious people are. Uh, but thank God, his people are going to wake up anyway. Amen? Amen? We don't have to stay asleep. And people are waking up. And it does my heart a lot of good. When the devil thinks he can get away with it, he's going to bring the issue out into the open. And you'll see it in the news. You'll see it everywhere on the radio, news, and everywhere about this Sunday law issue. And the devil, once he does that, he knows he's got to push it hard and fast until he gets it passed. But he's not going to bring it in the open until he thinks he can get away with it. It's just like a lion stalking an antelope. The lion is, stays real low and goes real slow and real quiet until he thinks I can get him. And once he thinks I'm within range and they have a pretty good judgment of how fast they can run and how fast the antelope can run, when he thinks I, I'm, I'm within range, then I mean every ounce of energy in that lion is put forth to spring, hoping that he can get up enough speed before the antelope sees him until he can get him. That's why the lion waits until he's within a certain distance. Satan is like a roaring what? Lion. He's doing the exact same thing. This is why you don't hear anything about any plans or thoughts about any law like this in the news now. He doesn't want you to hear that. And so he's just laying the foundation for, since the 1980s and before for this thing. But when he gets the foundation all laid with the religious people and so forth, and there's different pushes left and then the push right and so forth, manipulating like a big chess game, when he thinks he can get away with it, he'll bring the thing, issue into the open, push it hard and fast, and the um, Catholic-controlled Congress, the Catholic-controlled Senate, the Catholic-controlled Supreme Court, uh, which they're already controlled, you know that already, they've been working on that for years, uh, will cave into the pressure, plus popular pressure on them. Uh, the devil, when he thinks he can get away with it, he's going to do it, and you'll start hearing it in the open. When you start hearing the issue on the news in the open, you can know that time is extremely short, believe me. 
because uh, the devil's not going to bring in the open until he thinks he can get away with it very quickly because he knows he's got to do, do it quickly. Just like when the Pharisees got Jesus, they knew they had to do it real quick before the, a popular uh, reversal set in to stop them, see? And the devil's the same way now. And so when that issue comes in the open, you know it's very short. And so, uh, you know, all, how many of the ten virgins have been sleeping? All, all ten. <laughs> yes, even the wise ones are asleep. Now, you might ask, what are the wise virgins sleeping to? I'll tell you. Even the wise virgins, they've got the oil. They've got the character development. They're not practicing willful sin, but they're sleeping to their duty to reach the world with the three angels' messages. How many people are craving? You have a yearning craving and praying, oh God, please use me today to reach somebody with your message today. Use me today, every morning, pray like this, to bring somebody to Jesus. Very few people are praying like that every morning. Very few. Even the wise virgins are not praying like that and have such a craving. You can have it if you want because there are enochs even today, isn't that right? You can be one of them. But when this issue of the Sunday law comes in the open, all of the virgins are going to start to wake up, wise and foolish both. The wise virgins will wake up and they'll say, look at this, what have we been doing? We, we, we've been hearing wonderful sermons, but we haven't hardly been reaching anybody. Let's pray and study and then let's go door to door and reach the people. And how will the foolish virgins feel about that? Oh, no, you don't want to do that. You don't want to get some message about some beast out. We just want to preach love. How long will it take until they talk like that? They're doing it right now. Isn't that right? Uh, <clears throat> and so uh, the, God's, the wise virgins will say, no, we've got to love the people enough to tell them what God says. Uh, we've been preaching love and what God says is love. And so they'll leave their foolish friends and they'll start going door to door, door to door. Now, by this time, uh, things are happening very, very fast. And uh, they don't have time now to have some PR program, uh, you know, public relations. They just go to the doors and they just say, uh, ring the doorbell. Uh, yes, can I help you? Yes, do you, uh, have you heard about this Sunday law issue on the news? Oh, yes, it's all over the news. And then, uh, do you know what it means? Well, I want to know what it means. And they'll just tell them. Just tell them right out. Now, we don't do that now. Uh, but when this issue comes in the open in the news, we will do that. That will be the time just to tell them what it means. And those that are honest, they'll say, praise God that you've come. Praise God. I've been praying about this, and I heard this and that from pe people, and, and I can see it. It's the truth. And they will accept it just like this. And they'll look in their Bibles, and they will very quickly grow up into Christ, become faithful Seventh-day Adventists, and they'll join us to go door to door with us. Finally, this will make the ministers very angry. They'll stir up their people against God's people. And this thing will be like a, a snowball getting bigger and bigger until finally the whole world will hear about it and then probation closes. Once that happened, the first plague is poured out. And what is it? Sores all over their bodies. Now at this time, the foolish virgins that mocked the wise ones and been having a nice time singing and swinging and sinning and celebrating, they will come up when they see these sores on their bodies. Some of them will know where you are. And Sister White reveals they'll come up and say, please, you and I went to school together. We, we went to church school and we were in church together and I had these terrible sores. Please tell me what I can do. And what will you tell them? I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I pray that no one here will hear those words. I'm sorry. There would be nothing, absolutely nothing you can do. Please pray for the people now. And so then we, they leave us, and, and uh, then the second plague, what is that? Water turns to blood. By this time, the wicked are already planning to kill us. God gives them blood. The third plague is the streams turn to blood. Now they turn on their spigot for some relief of their sores, and out comes the oozing blood of a dead man. The fourth plague, what is that? The sun scorches men with great heat. They've chosen the day of the sun. Now God gives them sun. The, the uh, fifth plague, what is that? They've chosen darkness. Now it says darkness on the seat of the beast. Uh, all these are all geared 
concern uh, against the beast and its image and the Sunday law, the sixth plague. By this time, God's people are, are in prison or hiding in the most desolate places, and they're already planning to kill us. And some cases, as you know, they're going to try to kill us before the law goes into effect. So they come and say, well, why wait till tomorrow? Uh, why not just kill them now? And so they raise their guns to kill us. And what do we do? Do we reach for our gun? No, what do we do? We raise our hand in the name of the Lord. And what happens? It says their swords fall like straw. Isn't that beautiful? In many cases, angels appear in, in, as men of war and fight for us. Or uh, uh, they just fall like straw. At this time, the foolish virgins come and the wicked, at the voice of God, the fifth plague, they actually fall down, it says in, in Revelation 3, fall down and admit that God has loved us. Now the seventh plague. And the battle of Armageddon, the hail about 60 pounds, beating the cities to a pulp. The prison walls are, are tumbling down and God's people are set free. And the people are screaming and yelling and trying to kill themselves. I mean, the whole thing is just chaos and loud thunder and lightning. And then they're seeing a little cloud in the sky getting closer and closer. And you know what that cloud is, don't you? It's getting closer, and you know you're going to see the Son of God. You're going to see Jesus. There he is right there. He's in that cloud right there. And then you can see all those angels covering the sky, and the wicked are still screaming, and all the chaos. And they'll say, look, this is our God. We've waited for him, and he will save us. And as you see Jesus coming closer and closer, uh, he has a trumpet in one hand, and he has a sickle in the other hand, and he blasts on that trumpet, and the blast goes around the world. And the third time, last time he blasts on that trumpet, he says, Awake, awake, ye that sleep in the dust, and arise. And you watch, and um, many uh, hundreds, thousands come right up out of the ground. You see them. And then you find yourself lifted up off the ground, and you're getting closer and closer to the cloud where Jesus is. And there's your angel. He's been with you all your life, but you don't look at him too long because there's something, someone even more lovely you want to keep your eyes on. The lovely Jesus. There he is, the same one that died on the cross for you. There he is, and you see his smile, smiling at you. And you see his nail-scarred hands. And we join him in this cloud, and then we go up towards heaven. And is Jesus going to take us to heaven in a vehicle? The answer is yes. Uh, it will be a great chariot. And what will this chariot, will it have great big wheels on it that turn? Yes, it's in early writings. And what are these wheels made out of? They're made out of angels and as uh, great big wings that go up and down. What are these wings made out of? Angels. I mean, and this chariot is so big that it'll hold millions of people. And as those wheels turn, the angels cry, holy, 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 Lord God almighty. And as those great big wings go up and down and we're going up through space faster than the speed of light in a huge chariot holding millions of people as the wings go up and down they cry holy 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 lord god almighty and is there one man that's found that's worthy to drive that chariot <coughs> yes there's one man with nail scars in his hands if will you see jesus driving that chariot would you be jealous of him so that you want to drive it yourself Oh, no, you'll be perfectly happy to have Jesus drive that chariot instead of yourself. And so you'll see that chariot is going to go all the way up through space. Now, Orion, the hole in Orion, it takes light 600 years to get her from Orion. The city of God is going to come through that great hole. Is it going to take us 600 years to get to heaven? No, one week. So you can see that chariot is going to be going much faster than the speed of light. And so we're going to come up to the city of God and we're going to see the 12 foundations. It looks like a rainbow. And we come up to the city of God and then we get out of that chariot and form a hollow square. And Jesus is in the middle. We have a ceremony. And he comes and he puts a crown on our head. And you'll feel that crown as he puts it, lays it on your head. And you'll look up to Jesus and you'll see the Son of God looking right at your face. And you'll see people in the universe he's looking only at you now isn't that a wonderful thought just you and him looking at each other and he smiles and he gives you that uh, that uh, uh, crown and he gives you the harp and then he goes to the next person and when this little ceremony is over then we all go into one of the 12 gates of the city of God each gate is made out of one solid what pearl 
The wall, I believe, is 275 feet tall. And so this is a gigantic, huge pearl. And Jesus lays hold of that pearl, each one, and he opens it with his own hand. A pearl is the only gem that was made through the process of what? Irritation. Suffering. Of every pearl is made through suffering. That pearl represents what? Jesus. Jesus is the pearl of great price. He lays hold of himself and he opens himself by himself for us to go through himself into the city of God. And so we go through that pearl and we get in there inside the city walls and you look around. And when you look around, what do you see in there? There is the mountain of God. There is, there is the, the temple of God. There is the tree of life going way up to feed millions of people every month. There is the river of life. There is, there is all the angels. And there is my dear mother. Look at there is my, dear, my, my mother. Praise God. My mother is there. And my loved ones are there. And you think, I'm, I'm really here. I'm, I'm really in heaven. I'm in heaven. Isn't that a wonderful thought? And once heaven starts, when will it ever end? go on forevermore and how many more months will it be until we experience this we don't know but I say months instead of years because because the time is so short and I don't know how many only God knows but I tell you the time is short so we have a lot of good things to look forward to don't we we really do praise the Lord and so this uh, what we saw on the screen is just gives us a little taste of things to come and uh, turn now in your Bible to the, uh, as we close, turn to Revelation 22. I want to read something. And I want to ask you a question. Back by that counter back there this afternoon, there was a box of National Sunday Law books. Is it still there? Yes. Yeah. It's there? Okay. I want to ask you this question. Normally, I bring at least one or 2,000. And I give them all away. Today, we only have 100. But I'm going to ask the same question as I ask when I have a thousand or two. And it's this. Um, how many of you are willing to, as you leave here this evening, uh, I'd like for someone to take that box and just empty it on that counter and take the box off of the books and just leave them there. Um, I don't, how many of you are willing to take some of them today home with you? And when you get home this coming week, Put them on doorsteps, phone booths, benches, uh, restrooms, parking lots, just anywhere that people are that will pick them up. How many of you are willing to do that this week? Could I see your hand? Praise the Lord. So um, uh, I think, I don't know how many raised your hand, but, and I don't know exactly how many we've got, but what I'd like you to do, I'd like you each to take three books. Only take three. That way most of you or all of you can get at least that many and put them out this this coming week and then in the future if you want to you can get more and put them out um, the main thing is to reach the people amen reach the people that's why we're here and so let's turn to Revelation 22 I'm going to read a few verses and then we're going to close uh, 22 verse 1 and he showed me a pure river of water of life Clear as crystal. Proceed. Manner of fruits and healed her fruit every month. And the leaves of the tree were for the healing of the nation. How will we need healing in heaven? It says when we eat the leaves of that tree, we'll grow up like calves in the stall. Adam, 15 or 16 feet tall. His kneecap is, it comes to about right here. That's his kneecap. Uh, that means if I'm Adam and this is me, my head comes to about right there. See how short I am? Adam could just lean over and pick me up and look at me. <laughs> and um, set me back down. He wouldn't need a car. A car would only be that tall. That's a car right there. And he could just jog down the freeway. He'd have to jump over the overpasses. Uh, that's how big Adam is. The angels are even taller, and Jesus is even taller than they are. But as we eat the leaves of the tree of life, we're going to grow up. 
we might be short now, but we're going to grow. Even the ladies are going to grow up to about what Eve was, and we'll all be really giants like that after a little while. Aren't you glad? That'll be wonderful. So the, even God will erase that deformity that we have, our, our, our smallness. It says, the leaves of the tree were for the healing of the nation. Verse 3, there shall be no more curse, but the throne of God and of the Lamb shall be in it, and his servants shall serve him. And they shall see what? His face, praise God. And his name shall be in their foreheads. Verse 7, Behold, I come quickly. Blessed is he that keepeth the sayings of the prophecy of this book. And finally, over in verse 20, Surely I come quickly. And then John says, Amen. Even so, come, Lord Jesus. His whole heart goes out. Finally, he says, the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you all. Amen. Amen. Praise God. Let's kneel for our closing prayer. Thank you so much, dear Heavenly Father, for thy wonderful blessings today. We know and even feel thy sweet Holy Spirit here with us this day, and thy holy angels all about us. Thank you for this. We claim the precious blood of dear Jesus, our Lord and Savior. We know we're going to see thee very soon. Take us now, therefore. Take our will. Take our heart. Take everything we have and everything we are to abide in thee and thou in us, and be used by thee, like these people in the Soviet Union, to reach souls. Give us your tender love for souls, we pray and to stand even if we have to stand alone when the majority forsake us. Make us like Daniel and his friends to stand up for Jesus. Bless each one now, I pray. Please save the children. We must have the dear children. Help us train them for heaven and for purity and holiness. Bless each one now until we're home, even home to heaven. We ask and thank you, dear Father, in Jesus' name, amen. You're dismissed. Praise God. Praise the Lord. Praise God. Thank you so much. Uh -huh.